Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplify, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we would be analyzing the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper of 19th June 2018. Now let us begin. Now before moving forward, in the analysis of today's newspaper, what we'll do for a couple of days is first understand the questions that have been asked in the prelims of 2018 and on how DNS and the Focus magazine would have helped you for the preparation of the prelims of 2018. Now the question given here had asked who are the free trade partners of ASEAN and for which it has given six options. Now the first thing you need to understand as to which part of the syllabus this would be placed in your prelims examination. Where in this question which had asked the free trade partners of ASEAN would be placed in the current events of international importance. Now the current event that this question refers to is the first RCEP summit that was held in Philippines in 2017. Now the international importance of the first RCEP summit is that it intends to be a free trade agreement among the 10 members of ASEAN and the 6 FTA partners. And this is the context in which a question was asked in the prelims of 2018 to who are the free trade partners of ASEAN. And this information was covered multiple times in your DNS, wherein it was covered in the DNS of 23rd January, which had given the 6 members which are India, China, Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea. Apart from the coverage as to why RCEP was in the news and what is the international importance of the first RCEP summit. And in similar terms, it was also covered in the Focus magazine, wherein the first RCEP summit was covered in the December edition of the Focus magazine, which had also given the context as to why the first RCEP summit is of international importance, wherein it is an agreement being negotiated between the ASEAN and its six FTA partners. And it is within this context in DNS and in Focus magazine which provides as to which part of the syllabus a particular news belongs to either in your prelims examination or your mains examination and then subsequently provides the information that are needed to be remembered or concepts that are required to be understood. And it is within this regular coverage through DNS, Focus magazine and the test series that will give you a comprehensive coverage and allow you to answer questions within your prelims and your mains examination. And so now with this, let us move on to the first article. Now Operation Seize Ops and Operation All Out were conducted in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Wherein the term Seize Ops is a more generalized term. And the term Seize Ops signifies that the army avoids conducting offensive operation. Now these offensive operations may include cordon and search operations and search and destroy operations. And when such a Seize Ops operation was conducted in Jammu Kashmir, it included both the army and the paramilitary forces. However, you should understand that the army only avoids conducting offensive operation and it means that the counter terror and the counter infiltration grids that remain in Jammu and Kashmir remain completely intact and therefore aspects of gathering intelligence, securing military installations, patrolling operations, road security operations among other counter terror and counter infiltration aspects are continued forward and therefore defensive counter terror and defensive counter infiltration measures are continued forward and it is only offensive operations that are actually avoided. And apart from this, Seize Ops operation does not mean that there would be a ceasefire at the LOC, wherein Operation Seize Ops was an internal matter of India and any ceasefire at the LOC has to be bilaterally conducted with Pakistan. And apart from this, Operation Seize Ops also does not mean that the army or the paramilitary forces in Jammu and Kashmir will step back into their barracks and will stop every kind of operations. Now the reason Seize Ops operation was undertaken in Jammu and Kashmir was that the government of India had asserted that it is trying to create an environment that is free of terror and violence. And such an environment which is free of terror and violence would enable the Muslim citizens of Jammu and Kashmir to observe the holy month of Ramazan in a peaceful manner. And to ensure that an environment free of terror and violence is created in Jammu and Kashmir the government of India issued instructions to the security forces which includes the army and the paramilitary forces to not to undertake any offensive operations during the period of Ramazan in Jammu and Kashmir. However, there were various exceptions to this operation seize ops wherein offensive operations would be undertaken if it becomes essential for protecting the life of the common people. Now hopefully up till here you understood as to what a seize ops operation and moreover, you also understand as to why the government of India introduced Seize Ops operation in Jammu and Kashmir. Now let us understand about Operation All Out. Now Operation All Out was conducted in Jammu and Kashmir in the year of 2017. And this operation was undertaken by both the Indian Army and the paramilitary security forces. 
Now, the purpose of Operation All Out was to eliminate all forms of terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir, which included terrorists of Kashmiri origin and of foreign origin. Now, this Operation All Out was launched after the unrest in Kashmir that occurred after the encounter of Buran Wani and the subsequent Amanath Yatra attack in 2017. And therefore, after the death of Buran Wani and the Amanath Yatra attack in 2017, the government of India began Operation All Out to eliminate all forms of terrorists that included terrorists of Kashmiri origin, such as of Buran Wani and of foreign origin. However, you should also understand the critique of Operation All Out, which subsequently led to the idea of Operation Seize Ops in Janbu and Kashmir. Now, Operation All Out allowed only temporary stabilization in the Jammu and Kashmir region, wherein the narrative of encounter of Kashmiri origin terrorists such as of Buran Wani began to tilt the narrative away from the government of India and began to tilt the narrative towards the separatists and the terrorist sympathizers in Jammu and Kashmir, wherein the encounter of local militants or of terrorists of Kashmiri origin by security forces of it incited more local youth to pick up arms where in 2017, 126 local youth in Jammu and Kashmir joined militancy, which was a sharp increase from 88 in 2016. And by midway, that is of June 2018, about 80 local youths in Jammu and Kashmir had crossed over to militancy. Now, the reason there was an increase in local youth entering militancy in Jammu and Kashmir was that the new militants are friends or relatives of those that have been eliminated in encounters or either belong to the same or the neighboring villages of those militants that have been encountered in Jammu and Kashmir and it was because of this negative reaction to the operation all out that became one of the reasons for government of India to launch operation seize ops. But however, the killing of soldier Aurangzeb by terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir has caused government of India to suspend the seize ops operation in Jammu and Kashmir. Now hopefully up till here you have understood about operation seize ops and operation all out. Now with regards to your UPSC slavers, it would be placed in GS paper 3 in the section security and within the subsection role of non-state actors in creating challenges to internal security. Wherein a question for your practice, what are the causes of the limited effect of the divergent strategies of Operation Seize Ops and Operation All Out to ensure normalcy in Kashmir? And so now with this, we move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 11. Now what this article talks about is that it provides the focus areas of dialogue during the 2 plus 2 dialogue between India and the United States. Now this 2 plus 2 dialogue would occur between the foreign and defense counterparts of both India and the United States. Wherein India has similar 2 plus 2 dialogue with Japan and with Australia. However, the 2 plus 2 dialogue with Japan and Australia is conducted between the counterpart secretaries of defense and foreign ministries. While the 2 plus 2 dialogue between the India and the United States would be at the ministerial level between the foreign and the defense counterparts. Now this 2 plus 2 dialogue between India and the United States would be held in July of 2018. Now the main focus areas of the 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue would be of the foundational agreements that aid the United States in defense cooperation with other countries. Now the article has highlighted four foundational agreements of which two India and the United States have already signed. Wherein the first agreement that has already been signed is of the General Security of Military Information Agreement, whose primary mandate is the sharing of intelligence information between India and the United States. Now the second agreement that has already been signed between India and the United States is the Logistic Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, and this agreement provides the militaries of both countries access to each other's military facilities, and this access is mainly for the purpose of refueling and replenishment. And moreover, you should also understand that this access is not automatic or obligatory in nature. Now apart from this, the article provides two foundational agreements that are yet to be signed. Now the first foundational agreement that is yet to be signed, which the article talks about, is the communications compatibility and security arrangement. And this agreement would facilitate the transfer of encrypted communication systems. And the signing of this agreement is required for India so that India can access the high-tech military US hardware, especially armed drones. And the second agreement that is yet to be signed which the article talks about is the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement. And this agreement was facilitate the exchange of geospatial information, wherein geospatial means the data that can be derived from a particular location. Now hopefully up till here you have understood the two foundational agreements that both India and the United States would be discussing upon 
at the upcoming 2 plus 2 dialogue in the July of 2018. Now you have to understand that this news is currently in transition and we'll have to wait and see on how this news moves forward. And now with regards to UPSC slavers, the four foundational agreements would be placed in GS Paper 2 in the International Relations section within the subsection Bilateral Agreements Involving and Affecting India's Interest. And so now with this, we move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 7. Now the reason this article is in the news is because the National Testing Agency will also train paper setters as in those individuals that form the exam paper in terms of its questions and answers. However, what is required to understand from this article is about the National Testing Agency. Now the National Testing Agency was announced in the Union Budget speech of 2017-18 and the mandate of the National Testing Agency is mainly derived from two reports. The first being the Program for Action for the Implementation of the National Policy of Education of 1986 and the second is the National Knowledge Commission report of 2006-9 to and both of these reports mention the formation of a National Testing Service. Now hopefully up till here you have understood that the National Testing Agency was announced in the Union Budget speech of 2017-18 and the mandate for the National Testing Agency is mainly derived from the Program for Action for the Implementation of the National Policy of Education of 1986 and the National Knowledge Commission report of 2006 to 2009, wherein both these reports mention forming the National Testing Service. Now let us understand the main features of the National Testing Agency. Now this agency will initially conduct the entrance examinations which are currently conducted by the Central Board of Secondary Education or CBSC. Now these tests would be like the National Eligibility Test for Assistant Professors and Junior Research Fellowship, the NEET examination, the Engineering examination of GAE, among other various entrance examinations that CBSE currently conducts. The second feature would be that the National Testing Agency would conduct other examinations in the coming future, such as other examinations which are conducted by the All India Council of Technical Education with regards to the GATE examination, among others. Apart from this, the National Testing Agency would be under the purview of the Ministry of Human Resource Development. And lastly, the National Testing Agency has been registered as a society under the Indian Society Registration Act of 1860. Now hopefully up till here you have understood the main features of the National Testing Agency wherein it would initially conduct the entrance examination such as a NET exam among others which are currently conducted by CBSC. Moreover, it would also conduct other examinations in the future such as those conducted by the All India Council for Technical Education. Moreover, the National Testing Agency would be under the Ministry of Human Resource and Development and is registered as a society under the Indian Society Registration Act of 1860. Now by knowing that the National Testing Agency is registered as a society, you can also infer that the National Testing Agency is not a regulatory body, it is also not a statutory body and it is also not a constitutional body. Now if we take a look at the previously asked questions in your prelims examination, questions have specifically been asked on government schemes or institutions within the reference of its purpose or aim. And with the explanation given in this section, you understand the purpose of the National Testing Agency and moreover, you also understand the various features of the National Testing Agency that might be asked specifically in the statements of the prelims question. And with regards to UPSC main slavers, National Testing Agency would be a part of GS Paper 2 under the section Issues Relating to Management of Social Sector Services Relating to Education. And now with this, we move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 13. Now the reason this article is in the news is because the Government of India is going to set up its 5th National Data Center. Now this 5th Data Center would be India's biggest data center and it would be formed in Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. Now the National Data Centers are being set up by the National Informatics Center or NIC which is under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology wherein the 5th National Data Center would be set up in Bhopal and the earlier ones have been set up in Bhubaneswar, Delhi, Hyderabad and Pune. Now these national data centers are facility that centralize the IT operations and equipments of a particular organization wherein these data centers store, manage and disseminate data for the government of India meaning that they host government websites, services and applications. 
Now what constitutes as services within a data center are computing resources, telecommunications resources, servers, storage systems, devices, access network, software applications, among other forms of components. When in these data centers host government website services and application, thereby centralizing government's IT operations and equipments. Now the third aspect is, why are national data centers required? Now there has been a push for digital ecosystem in the country and because of which data centers are now required to manage the ever-growing digital data. And apart from this, these data centers are required to protect the data privacy for government's IT operations. Now these data centers also power e-commerce and online marketplaces, thereby enabling the growth of online economy for India. And lastly, data centers play a crucial role in supporting Internet of Things, wherein data centers provide connectivity, availability and data storage to ensure the viability of Internet of Things. Now hopefully up till here you have understood the basic features of India's fifth data center. You have also understood as to what is the purpose of these data centers and why these data centers are required to form digital India. Now the national data center would be placed in GS paper 3 within the subsection technology and apart from this national data center would also form a part of economic development where the national data centers would form a part within the subsection infrastructure and similarly national data center would also be a part of security more specifically in terms of cyber security. And so now with this we move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 13. Now what this article talks about is the liberalized remittance scheme wherein the Reserve Bank of India has altered a particular definition of the term relatives within the liberalized remittances scheme. So what we'll do with regards to this article is first understand what is the liberalized remittances scheme and then understand what has been the focus of this article. Now the liberalized remittances scheme is a facility that has been provided by the Reserve Bank of India. Now under the scheme all residents individuals which includes minors are free to send money in terms of US dollars to their relatives outside India wherein the money sent under the liberalized remittances scheme can be spent in foreign countries for specific purposes such as education, tourism, asset purchase such as the purchase of shares and property among other specific purposes. Now this remittances limit is set for every financial year wherein the Reserve Bank of India has set the upper limit for remittances to be sent under this scheme at $2,50,000 per person per year. Now the liberalized remittances scheme was launched in 2004 and the regulations for this scheme are provided under the FEMA Act of 1999. Now hopefully up till here you have understood the basic features of the liberalized remittances scheme. Now let us understand as to why is it in the news. Now under the liberalized remittances scheme, funds were sent abroad under the basic definition of maintenance of a close relative. But however, as the article highlights, the Reserve Bank of India has narrowed this definition of relatives wherein the term maintenance of close relatives would only include immediate relatives such as parents, spouses, children and their spouses. And this change has been brought in by the RBI because they have defined relatives under the Companies Act of 2013 rather than the Companies Act of 1956. Now the reason the Reserve Bank of India had to alter this definition wherein the maintenance of close relatives would now only mean immediate relatives under the Companies Act of 2013 because the government of India had doubts that this facility of sending funds for the maintenance of relatives under this scheme was being used for commercial purposes which was not the objective of this scheme and thereby specifying the definition of maintenance of close relative the government of India can check the flow of funds and thereby prevent the misuse of this scheme. Wherein what had happened is that the outward remittances that were being sent under this scheme has shot up to $3 billion in 2017-18 wherein the amount sent under this scheme was only $174 million in 2013-14. So now hopefully up till here you understood the basic features of the liberalized remittances scheme. You have also understood as to what changes the Reserve Bank of India has made under this scheme and the reason as to why the Reserve Bank of India had to make those changes. Now with regards to your UPSC slavers, the liberalized remittances scheme and the changes made by the RBI would be placed in GS paper 2 within the subsection government policies for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation and in similar terms it would also be placed in GS paper 3 within the subsection Indian economy and issues relating to mobilization. While well, previously a question was asked in your UPSC mains examination which was asked in the GS paper 2 of 2015. 
which had asked to examine critically the recent changes that have been made in the rules governing the foreign funding of NGOs under the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of 1976. And in similar terms, a question for your practice. Examine the recent changes in the rules governing outward remittances for maintenance of close relative under the liberalized remittances scheme. Now you have to understand that the liberalized remittances scheme is a highly specific topic for your UPSC preparation. But nevertheless, you have hopefully understood as to what is the liberalized remittances scheme and what are the recent changes that have been made by the Reserve Bank of India in the basic features of this liberalized remittances scheme. And so now with this, we come to an end in the analysis of today's paper. Now we move on to the question for today. 